Hi, Bob. Hello. Hello. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing just fine. It's a little bit warm outside, but I'm not outside. So <laughs> it's fine. It's, yeah. a, it, it's a pretty nice day otherwise, and I'm doing fine. Yeah, here's Thank also you. a nice day, and it's always hot anyway. So, <laughs> uh, so today my guest is Bob Bixby. He's currently Noah Harding Professor Emeritus at Rice University and Visiting Professor of Mathematics at University of Erlangen-Nuremberg. He co-founded Cplex Optimization in 1987 and co-founded Grubby Optimization in 2008, serving as CEO from 2008 to 2015. Baum has published over 50 journal articles and is an acknowledged expert on the computational aspects of linear and integer programming. He has won the Bill Arshan Hayes Prize of the Mathematical Programming Society and the Informs Impact and Frederick W. Lanchester Prizes. He was editor-in-chief of mathematical programming from 1989 to 94 and chairman of the Mathematical Programming Society from 2001 to 2004. In 1997, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. In 2002, he became an INFORMS Fellow, and in 2012, he was awarded an honorary doctorate in mathematics from the University of Waterloo in Canada. Bob, you were a legend in our field certainly one of the most important personalities in OR history, and it's a tremendous honor to have you here today. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Oh, I'm happy to do this. It's a nice opportunity. Okay, so let's start. Bob, you were born in 1945, and a few people think you were originally from Texas, but where do you actually <laughs> come from? I, I was uh, born and raised in California, actually born in Oakland, California, and lived in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, basically until my wife and I moved to um, Ithaca, New York, to, so that I could attend graduate school. Okay. So the first 20 or so years of my life were, were spent in California, in the East Bay. Mm -hmm. Could you share a bit about your parents' background? Yeah, um, uh, my mother was a uh, registered nurse and worked as a registered nurse for, I think it was right around 40 years. And uh, she really was a nurse through and through. She really, that was part of her personality. Um, my, um, my father um, had a rather different life from, from my mother, at least before they got married. And uh, he was, uh, my mother is almost a fifth generation Californian. Um, my father was born in Iowa, and I, I think in the truest sense of the word was a child of the Depression. Um, he, uh, his family was on welfare for uh, significant periods of time, and when he was 16 years old, actually, he, a relative in California sent a, uh, basically a train ticket and said, look, um, if you like, you can send him out here and, and I'll take care of him. And his parents, without giving it a second thought, set him off. And that, just that, the fact that he was let go so freely, um, it injured him really, and it never, and it never went away. And then when he went to California, he um, he really had to start working, and he never, um, he did not finish high school. Um, my mother was basically had no appreciation for the um, for the depression. Her father was always employed and they lived on a farm and so they had food. She was really shielded uh, from most of that and it didn't actually understand some of my uh, the neuroses, let's say that my father that my father had. Anyway. Uh -huh. And you guys studied together in high school at some point. you and your dad, right? That is correct. My, uh, my, my dad and I basically got our high school diplomas at the same time and uh, he used to actually sit with me when I was doing math problems and would constantly tell me, don't just write down the answer. You have to give the explanation. You have to explain it. And uh, it was a valuable lesson. Anyway, uh -huh. uh, he finally graduated from high school. Uh -huh. uh, are you an only child? I am not an only child. I, um, I had a brother a six, six years younger. So... Um, my parents had two children. Uh, my brother, unfortunately, 
uh, died of prostate cancer earlier earlier this year. So there were two of us. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Um, how was your upbringing? Oh, uh, it's um, I'm never quite sure how to describe that. I I I I was a really quite confused child. I lots of stuff. I just didn't understand a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff was complicated for me. We had a great family, and and my parents were absolutely interested in our education. This was fundamental, but nobody in the family read. So I I, I read like one book. I'm not kidding you, a total of one book, uh, up through the age of something like 18, and that manifested itself. Like when I went to, went to university, University of California, Berkeley, you had to take an English competency test, and I failed it. I had to actually take bonehead English when you know when I started. But I did a lot of things that were fun. We went camping and we would go fishing. Um, my dad really liked. He didn't like to eat fish, but he liked to go fishing, and um, we liked to. We went to Yosemite uh, quite a number of quite a number of times, and I always had a penchant for building things like uh, my, we had all these batteries that my dad would kind of bring from work, something people used to do in the old days. It's uh, frowned upon now, uh, but he brought it and I had lots of fun with these things, making circuits and doing all kinds of stuff. I, I once I, I got all carried away with, um, we had a, 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 a vegetable garden in the back and I built this elaborate canal system and a way to get water to all the different things. I thought that was just, that was so much fun. So, um, you know, I did a lot of fun stuff when, uh -huh. when, when I was a child. Wow. Uh, what did your dad do for a living? He was a, um, he worked for the telephone company. He was a, um, an installer. At the end of his time with the um, phone company, he was, he had long since been promoted to be a foreman, and he was doing, what do they call it? Um, PBX it was, PBX installations. And he was a real stickler for details. He was always getting irritated with the, you know, the guys who were working for him, and they weren't careful with this, that, and the other thing. He really was very careful, extremely careful. Mm -hmm. Did you have any interest in sports? I had lots of interest in sports. I had no talent in sports. I still have no talent and I still have a lot of interest. Um, in high school, I desperately wanted to be on the basketball team. And in my usual obsessive way, I spent literally a whole summer, virtually every hour that there was, the sun was out at the basketball court, shooting and practicing and this, that, and the other thing. And I got cut on the last day from the team. So I did not make the team. Um, what I did do was kind of, um, to be honest, looked around at the landscape of sports at the high school that I was at and noticed that the swimming team was really crappy. So I decided to try sim swimming. And in fact, I got a letter in swimming because the, the team was crappy enough. And, uh, and ever since then, whenever I've had an opportunity to be in whatever sport or other, I will uh, try it, you know, when I was in... When I was in graduate school, we had a soccer team and I played on the soccer team and I played on the football team. And uh, even now I exercise, I ride my bicycle quite a bit actually, and do my best to stay in shape. And, and like I say, I've always enjoyed sports, watched sports of various kinds, college wrestling. I like, I like cycling. So it's, um, you know, sports I think are good. Now, by the way, I also think we've done a lot, my wife and I have done a lot to contribute to the sports program at Rice University. And one of the reasons for that is we both believe that being in, engaged in sports is great life training, it teaches you a lot of things you don't learn otherwise. For example, it teaches you how to deal with failure because if you're in sports, you're gonna fail. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm a big sports fan. Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, sports and music or arts in general, they help one to develop quite a lot yeah. uh, and it can be really useful in life. So talking about music, you grew up during a period in which music was flourishing, at least in my opinion. Uh, what did you like to listen to in those days? Oh, I like to listen to sort of, you know, in the, in not so much in the 50s. I was uh, well in the 50s and in the 60s. Those are the 
periods of time when I was really paying attention to music. And I, I paid attention to the pop charts and I was into it. And uh, I still enjoy going back and listening to, you know, all, all the old songs from that Buddy Holly was, was great. I enjoyed listening to him. And I also enjoy country music, um, which didn't somehow come from that period, but people like Don Williams and, and Johnny Cash and, uh, I like John Denver. I like Jim Croce. I, um, you know, Glenn there are lots Campbell. of hmm? Glenn Campbell. Oh, Glenn, Glenn Campbell. What a voice! What an incredible voice! Yeah. Yeah. No, I like him. I like Merle Haggard, Dolly Parton. I like I like her a lot. She's um, still active. She just released an album with you know covers of uh, songs from different eras. So Dolly Parton yeah. is still yeah uh, active. Yeah, no, she's very talented, great yeah. voice, and yeah. a great songwriter. Great song or yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Talking yeah. about voice and songwriting, I think probably you should have enjoyed Simon and Garfunkel as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I I like especially the soundtrack from um, The Graduate. Um, I I just thought that was a that was for me a very impactful movie. Interestingly, and uh, I I enjoyed their music. Um, I mean, Art Garfunkel has had a just phenomenal voice and. Well, Simon was a was a poet, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I love many of their songs, uh, from "Sound of Silence" to "I Am a Rock" and oh, yeah. so on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And of course, Mrs. Mrs. Robinson. Robinson. Mrs. Robinson from the movie. Absolutely. <laughs> also, did yeah. Movie. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and did you play any instrument? Yeah, I. My parents decided it was my mother primarily decided accordion was a good thing uh, instrument to learn. I frankly, I think it's a terrible instrument. I don't like accordion music at all, but that's what I, they had me taking accordion lessons, but I, I never practiced and uh, I, I, I wasn't any good. <laughs> if you don't practice, you know, I, I certainly wasn't a natural talent, but I did play the accordion for uh -huh. some period of time. Yeah. And how did you do in school? <laughs> well, I was terrible in grammar school, okay in high school and exceptional at university, I think that's a, that's a summary. And in, in in grammar school, um, I just had all kinds of all kinds of um, problems. I literally had to go to summer school to graduate from the fourth to the fifth grade. And then in high school, you know, then there's a little more specialization and and so forth. I still really didn't study very much. Um, and I mean, I know a lot of very smart people who never studied in high school and went breezing through. But even Uh, I've never been like that. I have to study a little bit, and I didn't study at all. So uh, I did not do well, except for math. Uh, I, not surprisingly, did did very well in math. I had a couple of one particularly, <laughs> to me, interesting math teacher. The guy who taught algebra in high school was an ex. Um, or he's retired Navy. He's retired Navy. He's one of those people who do what a lot of people do in the U.S. You do 20 years, and then you can retire relatively young and go on and do something else. And he. So he was teaching, and I don't know that he ever studied math, and I don't remember him ever explaining anything. I'm sure he did, um, but I, maybe I wasn't paying attention. He just assigned every problem in the in the book, and I thought that was fun. So uh, I, I got good at algebraic manipulations. Had a nice geometry teacher, um, and had an actually a, a a really good chemistry teacher. Not that I learned a lot of chemistry, but he was an exceptionally uh, talented teacher so um you know I, i i didn't do very well in a lot of classes uh, i did well in the math classes and extremely well in the math classes and pretty good in in the science classes and then uh went from there to university of california at berkeley which nowadays is a hard place to get into back then it was sufficient that you were a resident and had a high school diploma the trade-off was that they had a reputation for flunking out about 50% of the uh, of the new students. That was a really quite the experience for me. I was the first, I mean, my dad didn't have a high school diploma until later. Um, I was the first person in my family, anywhere in my family, so far as, as I can tell, to go to university. And here was this place that had this reputation for flunking out people. And there I was, not a particularly outstanding student. And so I was scared, if you'll pardon the expression, scared shitless. And um, so when I when I went to university, 
I really buckled down and learned. So I learned relatively quickly how to make myself learn. I had never thought about it much before. And I realized what I, I've sort of developed a methodology to, to learn things and learn them well. And like the first, the first really significant class that I took, apart from having to take bonehead English, of course, um, was a chemistry class that was this gigantic chemistry class, first year chemistry class, taught by a guy by the name of George Pimentel, who was a fantastic teacher, kind of a Nobel Prize caliber guy. He never got a Nobel Prize, but he's the kind of person who could have. They had a really good chemistry department. And um, this class was 150 people or something like that. And a lot of these people were, you know, intended to be chemistry majors. They had gone to, to high school in Berkeley, and the Berkeley high school system at that time was very good. They all had advanced training in chemistry and so forth and so on. And I, somehow I, I got an advanced placement in this class. I have no clue to this date why, I was, why somehow I was in this advanced version of freshman chemistry. But when it came, came time for the final exam, um, and it was a tough final exam, I was number one in the entire class. And I know some of my friends kind of looked at that and said, what's going on here? Um, anyway, that was, um, but I was still scared shitless even after that. I stayed scared the whole time. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you finally graduated with straight A's. I did graduate with straight A's. Yeah, I graduated first in my class. There were actually two of us who had straight A's. So uh -huh. I graduated first in, in my class and... Uh, right. And why did you choose the industrial engineering and operations research program? I don't actually remember why specifically I chose industrial engineering. I didn't choose operations research to start with. So I, I thought I was an industrial engineering program. I chose engineering because I was going to university to be able to get a good job. That's what getting an education meant in my family. And so I, I was in engineering. And, and I knew I had technical skills and, and, and not literature skills, let's put it that way. Um, and so it was natural from that point of view as well. Why industrial engineering, I don't remember exactly. Why operations research, that I do remember exactly. I had uh, an advisor, um, a uh, probabilist by the name of Ron Wolf, who I think he's still around. I think he's 88 years old now, and of course, long since retired. But um, uh, I had communicated with him not so um, so terribly long ago. So he was my advisor. I remember two specific things from his advising of me. And one of them was, he said, look, you're good at mathematics. You like mathematics. What you should be doing is operations research. So that's a practical version of mathematics. It will fit your interests and your skills very well. And so it's precisely because of that recommendation that I uh, went in the direction of operations research. The other thing that he did for me, um, he got me into probably the single class as an undergraduate, single class that I've ever taken actually, that most influenced me in, in the remainder of my life. He said, look, if you're gonna do this math stuff, you need to go take this class. And little did I know that this class was the weed out class for the math majors. It was the class where they, you learn to prove theorems. Um, and that's where they got rid of all these people who came out of high school and thought they wanted to be mathematicians and weren't cut out for it. And uh, it's where you learn to prove a theorem. And uh, it was real analysis. And the first three weeks of that class, I was like, what the hell is going on? I had no freaking clue. Um, and, and of course, I was still scared shitless in the background. So that contributed to it. And um, then somehow, after this initial period, it clicked. And when it clicked, it clicked big time. I mean, from that point on, I was just, I was totally fascinated by this subject and the epsilons and the deltas. And I would spend hours actually on the weekend sort of lying on the couch, thinking about uniform equi continuity and God knows what. And um, I, so totally aced that class that I became kind of the, I don't know, the golden child of the math department. They were all trying to convince me to be a math major. 
And I would take some of these math classes and I could just do no wrong just because of that one class. And that, that one class actually very much influenced, it was a key part of the skill set for me, interestingly, that I took in later into the development of linear programming codes. It played an important role. Anyway, that's, um, that's what that did. And unfortunately, the result of, from my wife's point of view, because we got married, um, uh, I was at, at Berkeley from 63 to 68. We got married in 66, 1966. Um, you met her at high school, actually, right? Your wife? Oh, I met, I met my wife at high school. Yeah, we were high school sweethearts. Um, she dumped me for a couple of years after high school. Really? And that's, yeah, she did. I don't, she wanted to play the field or something. She denies it at this point, but it's in fact true. And I definitely didn't dump her. And, uh, that's actually why if you look at the graduate, that's why it's, it was a, a poignant movie for me. And we did get back together and we've been happily married with three children and five grandchildren for 57 years. So, yeah, she supported me in the family, the two of us, in, in our last year, year and a half while I was, while I was still at Berkeley. It took me an extra year to graduate because I was a co-op student. Uh -huh. So I went off and worked for some period of time and through some program at the university, which, you know, helped with the financing of, of my undergraduate degree. My parents, they had good, solid jobs and they earned a decent living, but it was a little bit of a stretch. Mm -hmm. you know, sending me off to school. So that was, that was a help. And, uh, right. So, uh, yeah. so, uh, there you were in California in the mid to late sixties. Uh, <laughs> there were a lot of civil rights, uh, movements going on around the time. Oh, One yeah. of them is the famous free speech movement that took place on the campus of UC Berkeley. Uh, when you were there as a student, yeah. uh, did you yeah. take part in those protests at the time? No. So, um, yeah, that was the time Mario Savio and Bettina Apthecker and, and the whole free speech movement. So I have to tell you, I'm, I've always been politically conservative. Where exactly that came from? Because why as a child are you politically conservative? Usually because your parents are or something. My father was actually an, an FDR Democrat. Uh, because of the, his feeling that FDR is what got him, gave him hope and got him out of the depression. But I, I, I've always been uh, politically conservative. I'm conservative to this day. And well, I wasn't happy about the Vietnam War. And there were lots of things happening on the civil rights front and, and the Martin Luther King's movement, which was definitely something that needed to happen. I was basically, this whole free speech movement just irritated the hell out of me. You know, they were getting in the way and I couldn't go to class and, and uh, no, I didn't participate, not even close. And then wouldn't you know it, I went to um, Cornell for graduate student and then they had a student uprising and there were some people holding guns on the steps of the student union or whatever on the front page of Newsweek. And so I was irritated all over again. Mm -hmm. And then I spent some time later at the University of Wisconsin who was trying to be a Berkeley lookalike and... So I was mad all over again. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I assume you were also not very enthusiastic about uh, hip me movement either. Uh, no, no, <laughs> not at all. Not at all enthusiastic. Of, so you, you uh, did not attend Woodstock or this type of... I never understood Woodstock. It just looked like a muddy mess to me. I just don't. My wife and I are the same. We look at this thing. We, people look back to that with reverence and so forth. I just, you must be kidding. I, I just never computed for me. Still doesn't. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, why did you pick Cornell over Stanford for graduate school? Yeah, good question. So uh, when I got out of undergraduate, I really had, I mean, I did so well. I had my choice. I got an NSF fellowship. I, I, I had my choice of places to go, as it were, and uh, sort of the three top places at least as I understood it, were Stanford, Cornell, and, um, and Yale, interestingly. And, uh, but there was just no way I could, I could go to Stanford. They, they were the evil incarnate. They were big sports rivals, and I, that's just no way I could go to Stanford. So I went, I went to Cornell. It wasn't a bad choice. It was fine. So you went from one uh, side of the country to the other to stay away from your rival, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, not to not to go to school, 
with my rival there. That's yeah, you could say it that way. I suppose <laughs> um, it was um, it was quite a culture change. I mean, Ithaca is a very rural place in upstate New York, and upstate New York is a relatively I don't know that it's changed since we were there. Uh, I doubt it's changed fundamentally, frankly. Um, it was a pretty poor area. And when you went out into the countryside and so forth, my wife was for a time um, worked on this bookmobile. And uh, she really got to understand, you know, how poor the people were. Um, the, the arrival of a bookmobile was a big thing, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, in yeah. that area. So anyway, we went, yep, yeah, we went back to Ithaca. Mm -hmm. And uh, you investigated clutters and matroids during your PhD, right? That is correct, yeah. Um, my, so my PhD advisor was a guy by the name of Lou Ballera, who is, by the way, still around. Uh, he's retired from, from Cornell. Um, he was a big influence on me, actually, I should say. I always think of him as one of the true scholars I've ever known. Um, He was really, I mean, interested in knowledge in a, in a fundamental, in a fundamental way, and that certainly influenced me. He was a game theorist at the beginning of his career, and there were these things called simple games, which is a different word for a clutter, which was a collection of sets with a certain property, and so that's how I got into that particular subject, and then looked at sort of composition and decomposition structures, very mathematical stuff um uh and you got a, a couple of nice results in the end right i got some yeah I, i i mean i got some okay results for clutters but i got some very nice results in matroid theory i think unquestionably my number one theoretical contribution was the proof of the characterization of ternary matroids matroids represented over the field of three elements um that's clearly my biggest and most non-trivial uh, mathematics mathematics contribution. That's great. Um, uh, Delbert Ray Fulkerson, a legend in the field of OR optimization, joined yeah. Cornell University in 1971, and you were there at that time. Do you have yeah. any stories to share about him? Oh, boy, do I. He also left a very strong impression on, on me and is one of the persons whose thoughts or ideas or however you want to put it certainly influenced me. Yeah, he came to came to um, Cornell post-divorce, and he was a very, fundamentally a very unhappy individual. Uh, you know, one of the things I remember when he first arrived, so you said Delbert Ray Fulkerson, but he hated the Delbert. He went by Ray Fulkerson. But you could only, by searching, you could find out about the Delbert. Um, and when he arrived at Cornell, he wanted to be one of the guys. He needed that. And he told all of the graduate students in no uncertain terms, he didn't want to be called professor this, that, or the other thing. He wanted to be called Ray. Well, unfortunately, this had exactly the opposite of the effect that he wanted because there was no way we could call this man Ray. And so we called him nothing. And we avoided conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations with him, which of course is not, was not his goal, but that, that was the result of it. Um, the two biggest things that I remember about him, other than this basic sadness about him, was that he was incredibly careful. I'll come back to that in a second. Incredibly careful. And secondly, had incredibly good instincts about which work was important, was really important and would influence the field. So in terms of being careful, I mean, there are several um, examples, but For example, I, I, I proved this little lemma, and my advisor said, you should go show that to the great man. And he was a great man. And uh, so I made an appointment, and I, I gave him my little manuscript for this thing in advance, and I went in to his office, and he basically said hello and then kicked me out. He said, the result is wrong. And he kicked me out of his office. And the result wasn't wrong. It's just that my proof had left out a couple steps. I was in... That stage that graduate students are in sometimes where, you know, you're trying to be, you go from writing too much to writing too little. And I was in the writing too little phase. And so he kicked me out because uh, the result, I mean, it wasn't that I wasn't careful. No, no, the result was wrong. And I saw a similar incident with Manfred Hadberg, who many, you know, one of the 
very important figures in our field, particularly the development of computational um, integer programming. And he came, um, came to Cornell to give a talk. And I don't remember the exact words that were spoken, but the essence of what happened was the following. He's starting on his talk and Fulkerson raises his hand and says, your result is wrong. And he left, he left the lecture. And again, it was a case of Manfred had not been careful. And, and he actually had a, he did have a mistake in the proof. I didn't have any mistakes, I had omissions. He had an actual mistake. Um, and it was fixable, the result was correct. But in Fulkerson's, in Fulkerson's world, it was just wrong. He was, he was an interesting character. The other thing I mentioned about him was his, uh, I wanted to mention was his understanding of what was important. So he recognized back when I was a graduate student that the two people to pay attention to were Jack Edmonds and W.T. Tutte. And this enormously influenced me. I knew once you know he communicated that the work for those two people, it was worth understanding it and understanding it completely. It was worth the time. Uh, and that's you know that's that's huge. You know, I mean, he influenced me a lot to you know to sort of summarize things. And but he was a a compli it's complicated as well. I remember um, sort of my final story, if you will, about Fulkerson mm -hmm. that he was. He was, when he came to Cornell, he was very much into some things related to the so-called perfect graph conjecture. And he really wanted to prove the perfect graph conjecture or prove that it was incorrect. And he, in fact, he converted it into a statement in, in terms of integer programs and using some of the machinery that he had developed. And you looked at it in that form and it, you, you would probably have guessed that it was false. So he did not manage to settled the question, and then he received a postcard from someone from Hungary, I guess, um, telling him that, oh, somebody named Lovas, <laughs> somebody <laughs> named Lovas, had, had proved the uh, perfect graph conjecture. He made a statement to the fact that, you know, he found that out, and it didn't bother him. And he meant it. He meant it. At a certain level, it didn't bother him, but actually it was pretty clear it really did bother him. And there's a fundamental contradiction there, of course, but that was part of what he was. It was a very contradictory situation, and it was sad. It was very sad. I remember, I mean, when he announced that, that the theorem had been proved, I went home that night and proved it. If you looked at it from the graph theory side, not the integer programming part, it wasn't that hard to prove. It's just not to minimize the love loss by any stretch of the imagination, mind you. And... Uh, yeah, eventually, unfortunately, uh, um, he committed suicide tragically. He, right? Yeah, yeah, he tragically committed committed suicide. I think he was um, got rejected by a love interest. I think that yeah, was yeah, what yeah. it was. Anyway, uh, it was very it was very very sad. Um, they they attribute that to his uh, struggle with the Crohn's disease, but I'm not sure how uh, far that's accurate. But that's that's how it's okay. been told. But anyway, yeah, it's very sad yeah. story. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing a lot of uh, interesting uh, anecdotes involving uh, Ray Fulkerson. Uh, that's that's very important, historically speaking. And Bob, did you have the chance to meet other legends from the field like Lazo Lovas, uh, Jack Admons, and Vashek Shvatel at that time? Yes, I did over a period of years. I, I did have a chance to meet Edmonds, met Tut, um, eventually met Lovas, though it was not during my... Um, graduate studies and Vashek, not 100% sure when I first met Vashek, but it was not during my time as a graduate student. I think the first time I actually met him was sort of virtually when when I was in the same, in the job market as the same, unfortunately, as the same time as, as Vashek um, was. So um, he Edmonds- was He was a superstar, right? Uh, no, no, he was the superstar. Vashek was the superstar, yeah. right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Very much so, and and properly so. He he was, and he is a superstar. Yeah. Um, so Jack Edmonds, uh, Fulkerson arranged that Jack Edmonds would come and give a give a talk. And um, this is while he was still at the National Bureau of Standards, and he, he had a crew cut, and he was wearing a sport jacket. I mean, anybody who knows Jack Edmonds is like, you must you must be kidding. No, I'm not kidding. That's what he was, and he gave this 
totally incomprehensible lecture. I remember him scratching a circle on a board and drawing some lines up and down like that and said, that's a transversal matroid. That's the only concrete thing that he said that I can actually remember, uh, but not that he really explained it, but just his presence made uh, a lasting, a lasting in, in impression on me. Of course, his work has turned out to be the fundamental set of ideas, building blocks behind all of combinatorial optimization. You can't overstate the, uh, the importance of his work. And I saw this in the ensuing years. He had, at the height of his power, he had a, such a total grasp of the matching problem of all the things he was working on, including some Metroid optimization stuff. You couldn't, if you mentioned something, it wasn't that he would get mad, it's just, and you'd say, well, I've got this result. And he said, oh yeah, but beside, in addition, you can also prove this, 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 and the other thing. He had totally, the whole thing was in his head. He totally understood the subject. It was really, it was really something. And um, Tut, who we may come back to a little bit, a little bit later, um, was also invited by Fulkerson to give a, a talk, and he was really a <laughs> clearly a alien, a strange, <laughs> an alien, a strange, a very strange person. I remember he, and this was his style of writing actually. His lecture, he, he had a fact here, and then he had another fact. And there were no imprecisions, mind you, and there was another fact, and another fact, and. We're all scratching our heads and wondering where this is going. And finally, at the end, and because of fact A, C, D, F, G, this theorem is true. And he put up the theorem and he was done. Right. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really, I, I still remember him, the way he walked back and forth, these things make an impression on you. So that was, that was really, um, really something. Uh -huh. My... You know, I, I got introduced to Lovas, of course, I got introduced to the name through this Fulkerson experience, but I also got introduced to Lovas's um, power as, as a mathematician. Um, I have at least two stories, I think one of which Fashik was involved in, and he may have already told this, and in, in, I think he did a podcast as well. Yeah, 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 um, he told that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the one yeah. that they tried to get him drunk. <laughs> they tried to get him drunk, yeah, yeah. after he after two days where people were listing conjectures and the next day he would ask for some time and then actually prove or disprove every single one of the conjectures. He did that two days in a row and Vashik came to the realization, oh crap, maybe I'm not the absolute best guy on the block. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's see if we can corrupt, corrupt him. The other Lovas story I have is from his collaboration with uh, Martin Grotchel and Lex Scriver, of course, both of whom are among the outstanding talents in our field over the years. They were working on their book on the theoretical consequences of the ellipsoidal method. And they were sitting down, they were trying to prove some theorem. And as Martin related, related it to me, he said, Lotzi started thinking, he said, wait a minute. And I, this is a little bit allegorical. I'm gonna put specifics in that might not be exactly right, but the story is absolutely true. So he's, he says, um, if you look in such and such a book on page 87 in the proof of this theorem and probably stated the theorem, there's an idea right there. That idea can be applied to prove this theorem. And so of course then Lex and, and, and Martin had a homework assignment, which was typical of the way the book worked. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they went and found it and lo and behold, it was right where he said it was. And they went ahead and proved it. I just. Wow. He's just so that's mind boggling. You know, <laughs> it is mind boggling. His, yeah, uh, yeah. incredible. Some anyway. people, some people are really gifted, and you, you, you just have well, to sit yeah. back and admire. <laughs> yeah, Lovas was not only gifted; he's like just a, a nice guy, incredibly a family man, well adjusted, um, pleasant to talk to. Um, so he I, was just, surprisingly normal. <laughs> he is, in fact. In in, out, in many outward respects, surprisingly, surprisingly normal. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's really uh, and he's, he's 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 got a wonderful wife, by the way. That probably helps. Uh -huh. And um, anyway, he's yeah yeah very spe very special as we all know. 
Yeah, Bob, how hard was it for you to find a position after completing your PhD? It was pretty, it was difficult, um, I must admit. Um, I, my thesis was pretty abstract and very mathematical. Um, I did not done anything that would be attractive for an IEOR department or anything like that. And uh, and I, I was really, it was really pure mathematics. And of course, I didn't come from the pure mathematics community. So you put those two together, you get limited perspective on it. And uh, I really, in the end, only had two serious opportunities, both of whom made offers, and that was Clemson and the University of, of Kentucky. The, there's a little bit of a story, behind, perhaps interesting story behind the University of Kentucky. My advisor said, said to me one week, he said, look, you need to go down to SUNY Binghamton, which was near to Cornell. Uh, a guy by the name of Roger Wetz is giving a talk. He's at the University of Kentucky, and maybe you can talk to him and improve your chances of getting getting an offer. So I went down dutifully, and um, this place, I mean, you're a poor graduate student, and uh, you know, you're know you being careful what you buy and what you spend money on, including the food and so forth. And they had this incredible spread of food before this talk. I mean, they had these incredible donuts and I just totally um, ate far too much. I just crammed myself full of stuff. And then what happened? I went and sat in the front row right in front of this guy and fell dead asleep. I have no idea what he talked about. I was sleeping in the front row. And uh, when I got an offer from them, I, I, for a while I wondered how could this possibly be true after this terrible performance? It was only a, a few years later when I got to know Roger Wetz a little bit better, I found out that when he's giving a talk, um, he's a stochastic programming guy fundamentally. Uh -huh. When he's giving a talk, he's he just so fundamentally believes that what he's doing is so absolutely important that everybody's gonna be enthralled about it. He never paid attention to the audience. You could just as well not have an audience. He just is happy to get up and and talk about it. He, he surely just simply didn't even notice that I was asleep. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good for me. So I lucked out. Anyway, that was my that was my first job. Uh, yeah. So you went to so. Kentucky and, and stayed there for uh, several years. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Bob, as you already hinted, you were highly influenced by uh, this legendary mathematician by the name of uh, W. T. Tut, who's yeah. perhaps not widely known as he should but uh, who had a great impact not only in the field of graph theory, but also in the Second World War uh, when it came to code breaking. Um, could yeah. you please comment on this? I mean, his influence and if you have any sure. stories. Sure, well, let, let, let me start with the code breaking because um, his, his contribution to code breaking is simply astonishing. It, it, it really... The stuff that they did, other stuff they did at Bletchley Park that were all with the Enigma machine and so forth and so on, I think quite clearly pales in comparison to what Tut achieved. So he was there, he was a, a trade as a chemical engineer, but he was he was a strange person, I would have mentioned that all, already. Um, and Turing didn't like him. Oh. And so he did not include him in, in the Enigma stuff that that they were doing. But if we step back a little bit, there were really two codes fundamentally that were being used. One was the Enigma code and the other was what's called the Lorentz cipher. And the Enigma um, stuff was used for at the lower level with people in the field and communicating at that level. The Lorentz cipher was used to communicate at the higher level with strategic things among the leaders. And it was much more advanced in its technology and much more complex. And in the view of many, also the more important of the two. So the Lorentz cipher actually remained um, confidential information up until 2002, almost approaching 60 years because it was so important and continued to be used. Um, Tut single-handedly, he was not helped by anybody, figured out, saw a pattern and figured out how to break the code without ever having access to a machine. Unlike the Enigma 
uh -huh. guys. It's just truly a, a phenomenal achievement. And anybody who's interested, if you just look for, for example, if you search for Enigma versus Lorentz, there's even a BBC actually did a um, documentary. A, um, documentary on Tud. It's not so easy to find, I think, but uh -huh. if you can find it, it's it's well worth listening to. He he should be much. That's probably the single most important contribution he made in 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 his lifetime. And and it helped he just, saving so many lives, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It was just a phenomenal achievement. And literally on the day that it became unclassified, he gave a lecture on it at the University of Waterloo. He was waiting, he was waiting, and justifiably so, waiting, waiting for that, um, for waiting over for that 50 day. years that he could yeah. finally disclose what he did. I mean, yeah. can only imagine what went in his mind, right? For, I mean, five yeah. decades. Yeah, 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 he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have shown it necessarily, but he was, uh, he was amazing. And then of course he made, some people um, consider him to be, I think many people consider him to be the greatest graph theorist of all time. Uh -huh. Um, I kind of tend to think it's maybe it's Paul Seymour, but it's, uh, I, to be honest, it's, it's out of my pay grade to make <laughs> differentiate between two phenomenal um, people like that. Um, so um, Todd had a big individual influence on me. Um, he had a um, paper called Lectures on Metroids. It's about 60 pages long. And in the background for me is this Fulkerson guy who told me, look, Todd's work is important. Well, everybody recognized that that particular paper was important, but everybody would read it and then translate it into their own terminology somehow. Tuts, it was difficult to read what he wrote, and his his approach was strange, shall we say, unorthodox. And uh, compared to definitely, others. it was definitely unorthodox. It was unique, mm -hmm. and um, I concluded looking around, said, you know. If this work is so important, I wonder what you could achieve if you simply tried to understand it from Tut's point of view. So I literally spent a year and a half immersed in that paper and it did, I think, in the end, come pretty darn close to absorbing his point of view. And um, the end of that year and a half sort of coincided with when I was at the Mass Research Center visiting University of Wisconsin. Um, and on a, a one particular weekend, I decided, okay, let's see if I can do something with all of this. And so I sat down and there was this theorem that had been announced about the characterization of ternary matroids, but no proof of it ever appeared. And, um, as that, that supposed proof has never materialized actually. Um, so I said, well, let's see if I can prove that theorem. So I proved it over the weekend and, um, then I went to, we had a little group that was meeting to talk about Metroid theory and stuff. It was organized by Richard Brualdi, who um, was on the math faculty there. He was a, a well-known person in Metroid theory, particularly transversal Metroids. And I just kind of, I mentioned, you know, over the weekend, by the way, I uh, I proved this theorem on ternary Metroids. And he was just, what? <laughs> you must be kidding. <laughs> Have you any idea? Uh, I had no idea. <laughs> But it was, you might have argued that it was the single biggest theorem in Metroid theory at that point in, in time. So it was a big deal. I mean, it led to me immediately getting tenure at the University of Kentucky. And um, a, somewhat later, I, I had a chance to visit the, uh, Waterloo and talk to Tut. Talk to Tut. So that in and of itself was an experience. This guy possessed no small talk. I mean, this is like a Kelvin zero, you know, and I couldn't get him to say anything. And so finally I, I described the proof at a high level. And the only thing he said was, oh, it could be minus one. And that, he was right. That was a central part to finding this proof as opposed to the the characterization for totally unimodular matroids. And that, when he said that, and the way he said it, it was clear to me anyway, I, I have no proof of this, but it was clear to me that he had actually thought about this result and maybe tried to prove it. So then I felt really good. 
a, a it felt really good for a while, mm -hmm. say about two weeks. And then about two weeks later, <laughs> I get a communication from this guy called Paul Seymour that, um, oh, he had a proof too. And he sent, he sent his proof to me. And I looked at his proof, which was way shorter than mine. And I realized I could never have thought of that. And so I, this brought me back down to earth, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but of course, in the meantime, I've since learned that, you know, in, in my time in this subject, so to speak, there are really three names that stand above all the rest. Well, four names, actually. Mm -hmm. Edmonds, Tut, Lovas, and Seymour. And um, Seymour is just an incredible talent. So there was no shame. In, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're right. In, in, in that. Anyway, that was, uh, that was a interesting experience. It was actually another interesting thing that happened while I was at the Math Research Center. They had a, uh, <laughs> they had a geometry conference. This is where I met Lovas. So they invited Lovas to this thing, and they invited Erdos, and it was all arranged. And I, I remember two interesting things from a little banquet that they had. We went to this banquet out in the middle of nowhere. The first thing was Richard Boaldi was a vegetarian, which wasn't so common in those days, right? Mm -hmm. And we're, we're out in the middle of cow country in Wisconsin, you know, <laughs> at this restaurant, and this guy tells him, no, he wants to eat vegetarian. So everybody else gets served, and he's sitting there, and nothing comes, and nothing comes. And finally, he gets this plate with a giant mound of green beans. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Only green beans. <laughs> and, of course, he was happy. That was fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the other thing that happened was Erdos was at and, and Lobos were at this meeting and we're walking around talking and so forth. And Erdos had something, Erdos always had something he was trying to prove. All he cared about was mathematics. Um, interesting character. And um, he was wandering around the whole night saying, uh, go, he would go over to Lobos and say, well, but you could do this, that, and the other thing. And Lobos would say, no, nah, that won't work because of this, that, and the other thing. And he would walk away. And then 15, 20 minutes later, Erdos would come back and say, well, but what about if you did this and you could do that? And Lovas would say, no, 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 that won't work because of this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> he, he just kept brushing off this famous Hungarian guy the whole night. No, no leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's very amusing. <laughs> I can only imagine you, you know, witnessing all of that. It should have been awesome. It's just oh, yeah. phenomenal, right? All those guys and get to know them. Oh, yeah. and... I got to witness, I, I give you one more Erdos story, which is not unusual. He we went to lunch, and he was famous for this behavior, by the way, that I'm about to describe. We went to lunch, and of course, this guy doesn't sleep, and he was taking barbiturates. He was well known to be hooked on barbiturates. He didn't want to lose any time to do mathematics, so he didn't sleep very much. And so we're at this lunch, and we're talking about all of this stuff, and he appears to be asleep. And 30 minutes later, bam, he comes up with a conjecture. He'd obviously been listening to the whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and he stated this conjecture and then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. What Maybe a... he was saving some energy, but still processing uh, what you guys were talking. Ex yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, uh, Bob, you were at Kentucky from 1972 to 1976 with yeah. an inter intermediate stay at the Matt Research Center at Wisconsin-Madison from 1974-1975. Uh, you also visited Cornell from 1976 to 1977 before moving to Northwestern University. Uh, what made you leave Kentucky? Yeah, so uh, Kentucky was a pure math department and I was not a pure mathematician. And in particular, I was always somebody who liked to go to the coffee room and chat about what I was doing and so forth. And I was like the applied guy in the, in the department, um, even though from the OR point of view, it definitely wasn't applied, but be that as it may. And the thing that really, the fundamental thing that disturbed me after I would describe a problem, then these guys would all, oh, well, you could do this with it and you could do that with it. And I was like, why would I want to do that? You know, their whole view of what you would do with these ideas was so completely different. I just... I knew I didn't belong in, in that kind of department. And, uh, you know, that was, um, and I had 
you know, I was in a better position to get a job at another place at that point, uh, partly because of this Metroid theory stuff. And so that's when I, which when I, when I moved to Northwestern, which was an interesting time. And I had some really good friends there. Um, in the end, it was a little too non-mathematical for me <laughs> because it had the, um, it had the whole human factors aspect of industrial engineering was an integral part of the department. And I was somehow never completely comfortable, you know, with that. Yeah, so. I can relate and I see what you mean. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah. What are your best memories from your period at Northwestern University? Oh, I think my, well, that's when I started working on con computational linear programming. So that's a, that certainly is a very fond uh, memory for me. Uh, the dean of the College of Engineering, um, oh boy, Boley was his last name, and I'm not remembering his first name. He's one of my two all-time favorite deans. I really learned things and enjoyed talking to him. And there were two people in, in the department who um, I really valued. One of them was Bob Forer, who I actually hired at Northwestern, and the other guy was um, a guy of Turkish descent by the name of Erhan Schindler. Um, Bob Four, many of your, anybody who listens to this will likely know that he's like the visionary behind Ample. Uh, Bob is a, is a very smart guy, very knowledgeable. He reads a lot, uh, knows a lot of stuff, knows a lot about nonlinear programming, linear programming. And in particular, he had spent some time at Brookings, I think it was, and knew a fair amount about the practice of people solving real linear programs. And I picked up a number of tips from him. For example, I think he, he pointed me to some of the work of Paula Harris, this very bright lady who had worked for British Petroleum back in the early 70s and published a couple of important papers. And he told me about that work and gave me some context about linear algebra and, and some of the stuff that was done at Harwell that was very valuable to me. Um, Aaron Chinlar was um, not in my subject area as a, a, a probabilist, but he was just, I just enjoyed talking to this guy so much. You know, in my life, I've, um, I've met two people. So if you look at language, English language, I'm a native speaker. Of course, English is a language spoken not by native speakers all over the world, especially in the scientific community. And uh, these two individuals are really the two people I've met who were not native speakers and understood the language at a much deeper level than I did. They're, both of them are, are, are much better writers than I am and understand the language much better. And those two people are Vashik Kvatal and Erhan Shinlar. Vashik just has, he has a lot of talents. Um, and one of his talents, he's just a natural for languages. He really understands language and, and I mean, you see that in the linear programming book that he wrote and he was actually got an award as outstanding young um, talent in, in, he wrote a, he wrote a, a, a short novel or yes. a novelette and, yes, yes. and got some award for that. It's yeah. just amazing. And Erhan was also a fantastic writer of, of the English language. Both these guys spoke with a, spoke with an accent. I mean, Bashik's accent is actually quite strong. And people misjudge that sometimes to think, well, that represents what he knows. No, not by a long shot. And Erhan, uh, you know, had, I mean, you could tell he was not a native speaker, but boy, did he understand the language. And every, he understood every, he had a reason. He knew why you did everything you were supposed to do. And he was part of what this translated into his, his structured way of thinking and his understanding of the language he was an incredibly popular teacher. And you think about it, this is not your standard guy who like walks in with a cup of coffee and wants to be buddies with all the students and so forth. He was very distant. I think you'd get the impression he didn't care whether you were there or not, but his lectures were um, individual masterpieces of structure. And he, ex he just explained things extremely carefully. And this was a non-trivial subject subjects he was teaching and the students loved it. He was always getting, getting top ratings. And mm -hmm. he was, he was also fun to talk to because he was incredibly opinionated wow. <laughs> <laughs> and he was often wrong, but it didn't matter. It was fun <laughs> to talk to him. <laughs> okay. So Bob, you then moved again, um, 
40 years ago, uh, in 1983, this time to Rice University, but it took a sabbatical in Germany in the same year. Yeah, it was a, it was a strange arrangement. So I had already arranged for the sabbatical before this opportunity at Rice emerged. And it was like the perfect opportunity from my point of view. It was a classical mathematical sciences department. So it really was modern applied mathematics. So it fit, it was really a good fit for me. And it was also um, the environment, the sort of the people there and so forth. I liked them a lot when I, when I met them. So I really, it was an opportunity. I did, just didn't want to pass up, but you can't, I couldn't get out of taking the sabbatical on the one hand. On the other hand, you can't take a sabbatical from a school and not come back. That's unethical. So Rice gave me that sabbatical. Let me take that sabbatical from Rice rather than from Northwestern, was, which was this little bit strange situation of mm -hmm. taking a sabbatical at the start of your career. Right. So. And you have an interesting story involving Jack Edmonds from that period in Germany. Oh, yes. Um, I did. So I was um, visiting uh, Bernhard Korte's um, institute in, on my sabbatical. It was like the place to be. Lots of people were visiting there. And uh, I was sitting one day preparing a talk that was sort of a high-level introduction to Metroid theory that I was going to give in, at the University of Cologne on, on the next day. And on this particular day, uh, while I was working on my talk, Jack Edmonds arrived at the Institute with his entourage. He always had an entourage. And uh, he was walking around the Institute and he comes into my office and here's little old me sitting in my office working on my talk and there's this gigantic famous guy, Jack Edmonds, who I knew, oh, standing over to me. He comes in the office and, you know, well, Bob, what are you working on? And so I, I described to him, I was preparing this talk and I was going to give it the ensuing day and blah, 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 blah. Oh, he absolutely had to hear the talk. I said, Jack, you don't want to hear this talk. You know all this stuff. It's, it's a high level survey. No, he wanted to hear the talk. And everybody in the Institute had to mobilize within the next hour or so to meet in the seminar room and listen to this talk. So Jack got his way, everybody mobilized and made their way down to this room. And I'm show up and I'm getting ready to give my talk and Jack comes walking into the room to sit in the front row. And here's this big famous guy wearing a black monk suit with blue metallic painted toenails. And he plants himself in the front, looks up and I talked for maybe five minutes and he concluded this was not interesting. He put on his Walkman, and that's the last thing he listened to. <laughs> it's like, oh man, was I was I was I pissed off? But anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so be it. Yeah, but that was that was Jack. That was Jack. So right. Uh, is it true that you learned German in one year? Um, I did. Yeah, I learned. Um, I learned German. Um, my German was. I think I'm not overly praising myself. It was excellent by the end of the year. I think um, I started, I had taken German in high school, by the way, but I was, I got like ba barely passing grades. I never studied. And so there's a little bit of a, of a German knowledge somewhere in, in, in my background. But uh, when I got to the Institute, I had this idea in my head that it was bad that Americans always just knew one language. And so I was hell bent on, learning a new language and I was in Germany, so why not German? <clears throat> and uh, so I took a, I took a, the book that I had actually had as an under, as, as a high school student with me. And I literally religiously every night for one hour locked myself in a room and worked my way through this book. And then after some period of time, when I built up some knowledge and language, I started speaking with people in the Institute, in particular, Frau Higgins in the library um, was very receptive to helping people learn G German because normally they, nobody was trying to do this. And um, by the time the year was up, uh, I had sort of, I'm, I'm told I had sort of this cologne, uh, this cologne accent, a bit of a cologne accent. And I think people could tell maybe that I wasn't German. They certainly couldn't tell I was American. 
Um, so, and then we left and my German rapidly deteriorated after we left, but I've said, since built it back up. So my German's quite good. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, that's very impressive. Uh, and when did you start coding for real? When did I start coding for real? Well, I, I, the first time I coded at all against my will, I should say, was when I was an undergraduate. So um, I had to do a senior project and it was pretty much unavoidable that this involved some computer stuff. I hadn't done any computer stuff. And so I went and got a Fortran book and learned enough Fortran so I could write, write a code that did some actually sort of local improvement algorithm that got applied to diaper services to improve the routes that they were making. So it was an interesting application and um, discovered that I could improve their routes by 50%. So um, that was fun. But I, the experience with the programming was awful. I ended up going in the middle of the night because it was too crowded during the day. And then you're using punch cards and and there are all these weirdos hanging out there. And, and you hand in your punch cards. And if you made a mistake, you find out the next day. And then every little mistake cost a day. And I hated it. I absolutely hated it. So that was it. I wasn't going to do any more computer programming. That changed in 1983 when IBM PCs appeared. Then I could, I didn't have to go to some computer center. I could have a computer sitting on my desk. So I got, I got myself uh, one of the first IBM versions of IBM um, PCs <clears throat> and started programming in basic simple things for my class, like maybe a dynamic programming algorithm for the knapsack problem, that kind of stuff. And also eventually wrote a rudimentary um, linear programming code for my class. And at some point in, in this exercise with the linear programming part, I learned that numerical analysts, so people who did real numerical computation, used Fortran. So I said, OK. I had my Fortran manual still, and I got it out. And, I converted it in, in, into Fortran. So that was sort of my introduction to programming. Mm -hmm. And during the 70s, solving linear programs was still very challenging. Uh, but things started to change in the 80s, and, and you began to contribute to that computational breakthrough in a rather unpretentious fashion. Yeah, so um, I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, I was. Um, so I was at, at Northwestern when this really started. And um, I had, as I just said, I had programmed a few things, sort of rudimentary stuff for my for the class that I was in. At the same time, I had a um, sort of started a kind of friendship with a guy by the name of Tom Baker, who was working at ExxonMobil at the time. And I had actually, I had, together with Bill Cunningham, I had published a result about converting linear programming problems into network problems. It was, it was a nice result, and it, it was well-received. And I think Tom Baker found that particularly interesting. And so he invited, actually, Bob Forer and me to spend a summer consulting with Exxon. And so we were at Exxon and looking at the linear programs that they were solving. And actually, Tom invited me to his house um, one evening and took me up into his attic, and he had a teletype. And on this teletype, he was beginning to build a product which was to become the Mimi software that was at the basis of the company, Chesapeake Decision Sciences, that he created a few years later. He was, by the way, in my view, one of the sort of the pioneers in supply chain optimization, one of the very first people to see the potential for this, for this sort of thing. So he was a visionary. He was a visionary, absolutely. Mm -hmm. A visionary, uh, a very talented guy in a sort of quiet sort of way. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had this sort of professorial um, attitude. manner, mm -hmm. an attitude, manner, just manner about him, professorial uh -huh. manner. Uh -huh. He was like the best sales guy you could absolutely imagine. He was just soft talk you into, and then you were convinced <laughs> it was, it was really something. He was uh, many talents. He had many, many talents. And, uh, he, I, so I, back at back at Northwestern, I get a call from Tom Baker, and uh, he says, "Look, I need a linear programming code inside of my Chesapeake stuff, and I'm using XMP, but it's written in Fortran. I need, I really want something in C, and besides, XMP is too big 
I need something smaller. He said, do you have a linear programming code I could use? And I, to be honest, I kind of lied and said, yes. I mean, all I had was this complete toy and it certainly wasn't written in C. But I said, yes. And, and so I quickly went and got my code <laughs> and, and, and found a, a, a computer science student. I think this was, I think I was at, I was at Rice by then. I was at Rice when this happened, yeah. So this would have been 80, 84 or so. And um, I went and found a computer science student who knew C and converted my, my code from Fortran to C, which is how I learned C, which to this day is really the only language that I, I've ever programmed in, really. Uh, at one time, I was quite good in C, not so much anymore. Um, that was the sort of the start of getting somewhat serious about linear programming, but it was still a hobby, actually. It was not part of my research. So I gave this code to Tom Baker, and then ensued a two-year period in which he was constantly sending me these little linear programming problems on which my code would crash. And you know, I said, geez, what a piece of junk. It's crashing all the time. So he'd send one. And I, it wasn't my research area, and I didn't know the literature, and so I would just kind of stare at it and get an idea and fix it. And he'd send another one, and I'd get an idea, and I'd fix it. And this went on literally for, for two years. And at the end of this two years, I get a call from one of his associates telling me that, oh, by the way, Amico wants to buy a license to my code. And I was like, what? You must be totally kidding me. This is pure junk. Well, it wasn't pure junk at that point in time. I, I, I subsequently learned that these linear programming problems he was sending me were snapshots in the solution of a, pro, of a nonlinear problem using sequential linear programming. And those linear programs are notoriously unstable. These problems that he sent me were the most unstable linear programs I have seen in my 40 years in this business. But of course, I didn't know that. But the upshot of it was that this code that I had written was very stable. And it was stable based on ideas coming out of this class that I took as an undergraduate, this mathematics class, really. That was at the fundamental, at the core of the thought process that I used. And it was not at all the standard stuff. It was just stuff that I thought of. And um, so then I decided, okay, well, I guess this code's okay. Maybe I should compare it to another code. And to me, XMP, I didn't know about MPSX and all that stuff. XMP was like the code that integer programmers were trying to use and so forth. So that code I know about, and I thought, well, okay. Ah, let me compare myself to XMP, but boy, I was nervous. I had invested all this time, and now I was on this high because somebody was interested in my code, and I absolutely wanted to succeed. So I went and got the Netlib test set, which was this teeny little test set of 15, 20 problems, whatever it was back then that people used. And I carefully selected a problem from the list that I thought was the best suited for my code because of the linear algebra was simple and so forth and so on. So I ran it. I was four times slower than XMP. I was destroyed. And it took me a day or so to pick myself up off the floor. And so then I worked for a week or two and I got it down to a factor of two before I finally stood back a little bit and said, wait a minute, this problem has a thousand constraints so a basis contains a thousand variables mm -hmm. and XMP is solving it in 70 iterations. He picked a lucky start. So then I just ran all the other models and I was faster on every other model. That was the only one I was slower on. And within a week's worth of work, I was like four times faster on all the problems. Fantastic. So that was, that was the start of the idea to get into the LP business, which for me, again, had been a hobby up to that important point uh -huh. in time. So after um, after I got these results comparing to, to XMP, of course I was quite excited and started thinking about maybe getting a, um, a little bit more serious about this. And uh, I did, this was the mid eighties and the mid eighties linear programming was not viewed as, as so interesting, quite frankly, uh, but wasn't, the subject was not done by any means. There were lots of problems people couldn't solve, but, um, so any attempt I made to sort of try to get some funding to continue working on the simplex algorithm, nobody was interested. And um, 
So that's, you know, that's when I decided to, you know, I wasn't going to give it away. So I decided that maybe I should start a company. It took me about six months to realize that I had zero clue how to run a company or start a company. And it was at that point that I um, decided to, I actually recruited a lady, a Janet Lowe, who had been, I've been teaching a class in the business school at Rice, and she was like the outstanding student in that class over the two years that I'd been teaching it. And I asked her if she might be interested in joining me in a venture with this new code that I had. And she said, yes, not a hundred percent. I understand better yet now why she said yes, but anyway, she said yes. And not long after that, um, her husband um, kind of joined in, but it was, so it was Janet and I who founded CPLEX. I was of course at the university and she was working at Compaq and you know this wasn't making any money at all so we couldn't afford to like you know quit doing what we were doing her husband todd Lowe, at the time had decided to go in business for himself so he was sitting at home and he started getting phone calls and he basically he concluded relatively quickly that this is more promising than what i had in mind <laughs> <laughs> and so he he basically joined the enterprise and became he was the ceo so, um, and in this process, I made a big decision, which I think a lot of people would not have made. And that was, if I was gonna really get something out of these people, they had to have skin in the game. So I actually, even though at that point they had contributed nothing, I gave them 49% of the company and um, it paid off. Absolutely. Yeah. And who came with so, the name Cplex? It was not me, that much I can tell you. My first name of for the code was, at the time, L-O-P-T, which in my head was linear optimization, yeah? But of course, L-O-P-T, when people saw that, they immediately said, oh, it's awful. Uh -huh. No, I think it was Janet who came up, it was not me. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Janet who came up with the name, um, Cplex, which combined the idea it was written in C with the fact that it involves Simplex. So Plex together with C, the name Cplex, which was a great name. And uh, I think I have Janet to thank for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I really ended up, I don't know if I had all the information to make a great choice, but I made a great choice. They, uh, Janet and Todd really did know what they were doing and did build up the business. And uh, um, I owe a lot to them for what they contributed. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you, you sort of got discouraged to to delve into linear programming by George Nemhauser. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't, I don't want to overemphasize this, but I think it was a typical sentiment. Let's put it that way. So here, here was this guy who was, you know, I was pretty successful with my uh, career to that point with my theoretical work, and then I'm going to go off and work on this linear programming thing, which at that point in time was viewed as just not so interesting. People had been trying to beat MPSX for, at that point, approaching 15 years, and nobody had made any progress on that. And um, I distinctly remember George Nemhauer kind of said to me, why are you, essentially, why are you spending time on this? This doesn't look like it has any future. And, um, but I ignored him. I was having so much fun, I ignored him. Yeah. I ignored, I ignored, and I mean, and I did have tenure by that point in time, so I uh, I just had so much fun. In the 90s, I just had so much fun. We've now launched the company, Cplex, and we're starting to work on this actual commercial code. And that's where all the steepest edge and dual and, and degeneracy stuff fits into that story quite nicely. Right. So talking about degeneracy... Uh, when teaching linear programming, many people claim that degeneracy seldom happens in practice and that uh, Bland's rule is the way to go in such cases. What do you have to say about this? Um, well, I can, I'll, I'll relate a, a story to you in, in a second, but the short version is it, it turns out when problems start to get larger, degeneracy does matter and you do have to pay attention to it. Do we actually encounter cycling? I don't know. 
but we certainly encounter stalling. <laughs> and you have to do something about it. You have to do something about the degeneracy. And Bland's role, I mean, I know Bob Bland. He was um, actually an undergraduate when I was a graduate student at Cornell. And his role is just a beautiful piece of mathematics. And um, But in practice, that rule restricts both the incoming variable and the outgoing variable. So you have no freedom to make a good choice for a variable that's going to give you good progress because the reduced cost is good or something like that. And when you get into numerical difficulties, you have no chance to sort of alter your choice for the leaving variable. Um, and so in practice, you literally cannot imp implement that algorithm. You'll get into, you'll get slow convergence and numerical difficulties. So it's just, it just won't work. Um, there's a, there's a story um, that actually uh, fits in here quite nicely and um, specifically includes this idea of, of the degeneracy. I, in the 90s, I, we were, it was just so much fun because you would get a problem and you'd make a progress and you get another problem and make progress. And so one really interesting example that I, that I got that had a big influence on the development of CPLEX was given to me by John Gregory at Cray Research. United Airlines had sort of given out a, a challenge problem. And the idea was if you can solve this problem, in the case of Cray, we'll buy computers from you. $7 million computers. So that was a significant motivation. And I was working together with John at that point at, anyway to, to, try to try to build a good implementation of CPLEX to run on, on the Cray. And so he passed the problem on to me. And I immediately started to run it. And I ran it for seven hours on a Cray XMP, maybe the fastest machine available at that point in time. It was stuck in phase one. It was making no progress. And when you looked at it, it was clearly it was stuck because of degeneracy. So the whole idea that degeneracy, you know, was not something in practice you had to deal with was out the window. And um, I I just went ahead and invented my own simple procedure for dealing with degeneracy, which was to simply take the bounds of all of the non-basic variables and expand them by a small perturbation using a pseudo-random generator. So this perturbation that I introduced had to have the property that it was random, but predictable. So if I ran it twice, it had the same behavior. So I just used a pseudo-random number generator and a small epsilon equal to 10 to the minus sixth and perturbed the bounds outward of the non-basic variable. So this preserved feasibility. And then as the algorithm proceeded, if a basic variable left the basis, and had not had its bounds perturbed, I would perturb them. And this simple algorithm works to this day. It's um, it's you know it's easy to imagine that it will work, and it worked. It worked beautifully. So great. The degeneracy thing was at least handled. So I could now solve the problem with the primal simplex algorithm, but it was really really slow. And at that point. Roughly around that time, I got a message from John Gregory saying that, oh, by the way, Bob, you should just forget about the simplex algorithm. The OB1 guys, uh, Dave Shano and, and Roy Marston and Irv Lustig, with their code OB1, have been able to solve it on a Cray in like 1,200 seconds. So there's no chance the simplex could do this. And uh, my reaction was, OK, you think there's no chance, but I'm not going to give up. So I thought about it a little bit more, and I thought, look, if this thing is so degenerate in the primal, maybe it's not so degenerate in the dual. So I quick wrote some code, explicit, produced the explicit dual, ran it, and it was much better. Still slower than interior point, but it was much better. And then I remembered, wait a minute, there's this dual simplex algorithm thing that Carl Lemke created in the context of game theory. So I went and did a little bit of reading, figured out the method and implemented it. it took me a couple days and um, that was even faster, but it still wasn't as fast as OB1. And then I heard some stories to the effect that John Forrest, who many people will recognize, a, a very talented guy who's behind much of the developments of the IBM codes over the years. I think he's also the person behind the um, CLP uh, coin yep. code. Yep. So, I mean, a very knowledgeable, very smart guy. And it was reported that he was having success with the primal 
using so-called DevX pricing. So I heard about that and I said, well, what the heck is this DevX thing? And I checked into it. DevX was an idea that Paula Harris, I think I've, I don't know if I've mentioned her name before, but she was uh, worked for British Petroleum and had published a paper with this DevX idea in it. And um, the paper is incomprehensible. I never succeeded in reading this paper, but I know somebody who did succeed and that's Don Goldfarb. And Don Goldfarb understood that what she was doing was really just an approximation to steep stage. And so I thought, to, and he wrote some very nice papers about it. And I thought to myself, well, look, if DevX is working, then steepest edge should work. This is a hard problem, should work even better. Actual steepest edge. And since the dual is a good idea, maybe I should do it in the dual. So I sat down and worked out the mathematics for steepest edge in the dual. And bingo, it was faster than Obi-Wan. So I was totally, I mean, talk about excited. I was in seventh heaven. And I immediately got in touch with the steepest edge guru, Don Goldfarb, to tell him about this wonderful success for what I viewed as his idea. And he was totally unimpressed. He first thing out of his mouth was, which steepest edge algorithm did you use? And I, I said, well, is there another one? Is there more than one? He said, oh yeah, sure. You can project the polyhedra and this, that, and you, know, you get all kinds of different methods. Uh-huh, okay. He said, yeah, there's a much, I think a much more promising method if you project out the slacks. You get simpler, up, up, simpler update formulas, it should be faster. That would be my recommended algorithm. So I went and of course looked it up and implemented this algorithm. And it was not only faster than OB1, it was way faster. And that algorithm, that algorithm, dual simplex with steepest edge, this led to the first sort of first class citizen implementation of the dual. It had always been sort of a stepchild that was used maybe in the context of, of mixed integer programming. It led to the develop of standalone dual with steepest edge. And that fundamental algorithm, it's been improved over the years, but the fundamental algorithm has remained the same. That's the single most used algorithm for solving linear programs today in practice. So wow. that was a that was a nice outcome. A absolutely. And how Simplex entered the airline industry in the mid nineties? Yeah, it's um that's an interesting story. So we we had been trying for some period of time to break into the airline industry and IBM with their OSL product, the uh, um, what followed on after MPSX, um, really had complete control of the airline industry, and we could solve some of their problems faster. But you know, the airlines had a great working relationship. They could talk to John Forrest, which was a big positive, and and John Tomlin, and you know, they would run their problems and they'd run them overnight and get the answer the next morning. And so, if they got it at 1 a.m. in the morning or 4 a.m. in the morning, didn't make a whole lot of difference to them, and we were just making no progress. In the meantime, we had begun a collaboration with Silicon Graphics Corporation um, to try to improve our interior point implementation. And the motivation, I'm not sure how the contact originally came into existence, but Ed Rothberg, who's this incredibly talented guy and one of the co-founders of, of Garobi Optimization, was at that point in time working with SGI and their marketing department, and they were trying to get into the airline industry. So we collaborated, and with Ed's help, um, produced a much better version of, it, of the interior point implementation that ran on the SGI hardware. So SGI had the fastest workstations on the market. They were parallel, you could run things in parallel with up to eight processors, so that gave them a computing advantage. Ed Rothberg was this expert on things like Cholesky factorization and parallelizing algorithms. So you put together the SGI hardware, the fact that Ed Rothberg knew how to parallelize the interior point algorithm, knew how to parallelize the Cholesky factorization, knew a, from his thesis, had a much better Cholesky factorization algorithm period, you put all that stuff together, our code was literally 40 times faster than the OSL interior point code on any problem of significant size of, of interest. 
40 times faster. The airlines still weren't interested. But then something happened. And I think it was US Air and American were considering a merger. I think that was the two companies. In any case, it was certainly two airlines were considering a merger. And as part of the merger, of course, you have some due diligence that you do, and you're trying to see if you can get advantage from the fusion of the two com companies. And in particular, you've got your fleets that you're putting together. So now you have a bigger fleet, can we be more efficient? Well, checking that out, seeing what the possibilities are, meant that they had to solve fleet assignment models. And the, to this day, by far the best way to solve fleet assignment models is with interior point algorithms. So we were 40 times faster on these models. Well, now they're not, they don't want to wait till tomorrow. They're doing due diligence. They want to try a scenario, try another scenario, try another scenario. And then all of a sudden, our nice to have became a must have. And of course, then they started using it. As soon as they started using CPLEX, it was doomsday for IBM. We just basically eventually took over the whole airline industry. Very impressive. And when did you turn attention to solving mixed integer linear programming problems? So, um, actually, relatively quickly after CPLEX was incorporated, founded back in 1987, I guess it was. Um, this is, may have been 1989 or so. I'm, I might be off by a year or so. Todd Lowe, who was doing sales, recognized that everybody was asking him if we had mixed integer programming capability. And we did not. And he was the person who recognized that we needed a, a MIP solver. So we internally, as a company, we sat down and built a plan to create a, a mixed integer programming solver. Mary Fenelon was the person, the developer who was primarily responsible for that with my assistance. The first version that we had was we actually contracted, um, I think Gabriella Sigismondi, if I have the name correct, who was a student of George Nemhauser at the time and was familiar with Minto. And so we asked him to sort of create the first version. It turned out um, he didn't really create a new version. He basically just took various pieces of the Minto code and gave that to us. We didn't know that's what he was doing, but that's what he did. George, George was very mad about that, but that's how it happened. And um, then we started, Mary, I said, with my help, started building up the, the MIP solver. And, uh, you know, it went through a steady improvement period. So the, um, these developments continued, and I, I forget the exact timeline, but I think we had blue MIP and green MIP, and we had colors for them. And, and when, we, when we would meet every few months or so, we would get a whiteboard and look at the progress and so forth. Um, and we were developing an OK mixed integer programming code. Uh, but most of the progress we were making was because of the linear programming code. So the maturity of the dual simplex algorithm and so forth is probably the single biggest contributor to the advances we were making in that period of time. Then right around 1997, 1998, that all changed dramatically. And this is when the Lord of Two Things happened. At that point in time, Song Hao Gu and Ed Rothberg had joined the CPLEX team. And the two of them undertook a project which I like to describe as mining the theoretical backlog. So there was all this stuff that had collected in, in the literature with cutting planes and other ideas that had never made it into the commercial codes. People in the late 1990s were still using technology from 1972, 73 in the commercial world. And these guys simply in one CPLEX release combed through all of this stuff and included a bunch of new stuff. And by the way, it's easy to say this, it's hard to do. And it's not just hard to do because there's a lot, but there are in all kinds of numerical issues and software engineering issues. And these guys had and have a special talent. So take Presolve, for example. Presolve, we all know, is, is made up of all of these simple reductions, more and more and more of them. But that code has to have the property that when a problem 
has the has the property you're looking for, you find it and you exploit it. And when it doesn't, you don't waste time. That's absolutely critical if you're going to build up this potpourri of, 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 of ideas. And these guys did it. And the result of this was CPLEX 6.5, which was really the turning point, in my view, in the history of the development of mixed integer programming. That release was an honest, an honest, scientifically honest, 10 times faster than the previous release of CPLEX. There were innumerable things that contributed, but the, clearly the two most important things were pre-solve and cutting planes. Now there's some disagreement about which was more important. I'm not sure it matters so much. They're both, they're both um, extremely important. And it was that release, in my view, and I think the view of others, I've talked, for example, to Martin Grutschel about this very subject. Um, prior to CPLEX 6.5, I think a lot of people thought, yeah, you can solve real world integer programming problems, but you're going to have to write a special purpose code. And with CPLEX 6.5, it was for the first time believable that you could solve a significant percentage of real world problems with an out of the box solver. And that has been huge for the development of the subject. And that happened in literally in 1998, 1999 with CPLEX 6.5. It was really a step change. And uh -huh. I want to emphasize this was not me. This was these two guys who did it. Uh, just incredible what uh -huh. they did. Yeah, it's incredible work. It's not only an incredible computational work, but it, uh, it changed the perception of the community towards uh, mixed integer programming and uh, the capability of solving real life problems and problems with uh, you know, different characteristics that usually were thought to be unsolvable up to that point. And, and you guys made this sort of a breakthrough and basically changed our field uh, around that time in the late nineties. So that's incredible. And, uh, what about the dynamic search procedure that came years later? I had many students asking me what that feature is. So if you could yeah, give me a, you know, a glimpse of, of that. I can give you the basic idea. I, I can't give you details, A, because I don't know all the details, and B, because people would be mad at me if I did that. But um, dynamic search is, at its core, a very simple idea. You've been solving a problem for a while, and you've learned something about it. Maybe you have uh, found a good feasible solution, and so forth. And what you do with dynamic search is you simply throw away the tree and start again from scratch using the information that you've taking advantage of what information you've collected. That's all. Now the details are um, classified, are very, very complicated <laughs> and have, have migrated over the years to this point that it's, um, it's, 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 it's very complex, but that's the basic idea. Okay. Um, one important, CPLEX feature that helps academics and practitioners when implementing advanced integer programming algorithms is the callable library. Uh, what motivated you to introduce uh, this feature? Um, so um, this goes back actually to close to the origins of, of, of CPLEX. So after we got into this business, one of the things I was thinking about was not just making it faster, but also having a component of what I was doing that was more of a research component that people would be interested in. And this was a point in time in which, through work of Manfred Padberg, Lawrence Wolsey, Martin Grutschel, people were starting to see that they could make special purpose codes to solve real integer programming problems. But, and what emerged was, linear programming was becoming a huge roadblock because the only solver that could was really strong enough to ma handle these things was MPSX and it just wasn't designed to work in that context at all. And so it occurred to me that that would be a good direction for the development of CPLEX would be to build it in such a way that it would work nicely in that environment, which led to the idea of the linear programming code takes over management of your problem. You don't have to know anything about the details. It takes over the management and solving. And if you make a change, 
just tell me the change. Don't tell me what to do, just tell me the change. And I will try to op re-optimize in a smart way. And that led to this sort of object-oriented, callable library model for CPLEX, which then everybody, of course, copied and turned out to be, even though it was aimed at academic research, turned out to be very, very popular in industry. So it was a, it was a big win. Did you code yourself the first version? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, wow. So, Incredible. Of I did. Yeah. And, and CPLEX was sold to ILOG in 1997. And how did that happen? It happened uh, not at, at, at my um, impetus. Um, Todd and Janet proposed the idea, and they gave me a reason. I think the reason wasn't their full reason, but the reason they gave me was that it was time to go international, and Todd was just not interested in managing an international organization. Now, I think really the subtext here, the real reason was the fact that the stock market was going crazy and, and it was a good time to be acquired. Okay. Okay, <laughs> acquisitions were happening. And um, so Todd convinced me that um, we should do this. It wasn't that hard. So then he made visits to like I2 and Oracle, and I don't remember the list, but variety of sort of ISVs of, of Sequex at the time. And I don't think he was really getting anywhere with that. And then ILOG, this French company that came out of the AI community, that was their DNA, um, was coming to the US and trying to sell themselves in the US, build their markets in the US and sell themselves as the optimization company. That's how they view themselves. And the message they got was, you're not the optimization company, they're the optimization company. <laughs> so we were the there. And so they came to talk to us and at an opportune time, because we were interested in that kind of discussion. And that is eventually what led to ILOG purchasing CPLEX, and keep in mind, if you don't know this, optimization for ILOG meant constraint programming. And in constraint programming, linear programming is a small subroutine. They were buying us to get a subroutine because they had been trying to build such a, that said subroutine themselves for a few years and had been miserable failures at doing it. Wow. Um... Yeah. Something really exciting happened during the Dynamax meeting in 1999, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, no, that was that was a fun experience and had to do with this CPLEX 6.5 story. So um, a fellow by the name of Richard R.P. O'Neill, Richard or Dick O'Neill, uh, is a guy who's worked for FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for many, many years. Uh, he's still active there. He's, a, he's one of their really, he's been a visionary all along. He understands the energy business from, from the industry side, but also has always kept his hand on the, on the pulse of optimization developments. And he got the idea in 1999 that, you know, here are all these people doing these things called unit commitment problems and related problems and we know those can be formulated as mixed integer programming problems, but nobody's doing mixed integer programming. Maybe it's time they're entities together, industry together with mixed integer programming research community. And so he invited people from industry and then two people from that research community, myself, and a guy by the name of Sebastian Syria, who some people may, may know. Um, Axioma. A, Axioma, exactly, a student of Balash who, who, who built the company Axioma. He's been incredibly successful as a businessman. Yeah, he, he was recently at this purchased, uh, he, he recently acquired a, a, a racing center there, soccer club from Spain. So, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, it, he, he did very well and, and deservedly so. He's not, this was not accidental. He's uh -huh. a very talented guy. Um, at this particular meeting, what happened, so we're there, the very first talk somebody gets up from industry, I think he was sort of an academic industry type guy. I don't think he actually worked in industry, but he was a, 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 um, a domain specialist, that's for sure. And he got up and started talking about the California seven day problem. 
which was a well-known, not trivial-sized um, unit commitment problem formulated as a mixed integer programming problem. So it had like 50,000 variables, most of which were integer. And um, he did what people often did with these kinds of things in his talk. He said, okay, here's this big pot. That's my target. I want to solve that. Let me take the smaller version, which was the two-day version, and see what works. And then I'll go on to the seven-day version. So he ran the, the two-day version, and it took like an hour or so to maybe solve the linear programming problem. And it was, the integer programming problem was clearly hopeless. So he said, fine. He went to the seven-day problem and did what they often did. He solved the LP and rounded and got some sort of solution and discussed the quality of the solution. Well, I heard this, and I knew that CPLEX 6.5 had come down the pike, which they didn't know about. And uh, so I literally chased this guy around the room for the rest of the day. And he kept brushing me aside. And I kept saying, I want to get this problem. Can you give me this problem? Can you give? And he finally gave in and uh, got in touch with a student, I think, and who provided me via some means or other, provided me the problem, which I then ran with CPLEX on an alpha, a DEC alpha, I think it was, workstation. And the seven day problem, the hopeless, totally hopeless one, CPLEX solved it to exact provable optimality in 22 minutes. So I asked for permission the next morning to give a little half an hour presentation. After all, this is what the meeting was about, right? And presented the results and the audience was totally blown away. And you can, you can actually, I've done this, you can talk to people who were at this meeting, they remember that incident and remember that was this that was the beginning of people starting to use mixed integer programming in that space, which is now the accepted way to uh, to solve their problems. So that's pretty cool, pretty cool experience. Yeah, and you gave up your tenure position at Rice in 1998, but you officially retired in 2000, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was basically time for me to accept responsibility as department chair in the department I was in at Rice. Well, I mean, CPLEX was doing extremely well, was scientifically interesting, had it just by itself lots of academic contacts. It just made no sense for me to start spending the majority of my time on being a department chair when I had this other thing that was had all those nice properties and was making a lot of money. So um, I didn't, what I didn't want to do is what I know a number of people have done over time. They develop a consulting business or whatever, and that becomes the focus of what they're doing, but they're keep their tenured position because it's security and kind of hold it hostage. And I didn't want to be one of those people. So I went to the Dean who was, I had two favorite deans. I want, mentioned one earlier, Bully, um, Bruno Bully was his name. And um, and my second favorite one was Michael Carroll, who was the um, the dean of of the engineering college at that time. Um, and when I, I went to talk to him and told him my situation and and that, that I was prepared to give up tenure and would probably slowly disengage, he understood completely, and he helped me implement what I wanted to do. And officially, I guess the university views me as having retired in in 2000, mm -hmm. so. Tell me about your involvement in the Concord TSP solver and could you share a couple of anecdotes from that project? Sure, happily. Um, so I can't remember the exact year uh, when I got involved in it. I remember how the involvement came to be, but not exactly when. So um, they were, you know, the, 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 little, the group made up of Bill Cook, David Applegate and Vashik Fatal sort of got together right around 1990, right around the time we had this meeting that I organized at, at Rice called TSP90. And uh, it was a very successful little meeting. And um, that was sort of their first visible, they were starting to visibly contribute to the subject. Sometime after that, Bill was presented me with this, with this idea of something that became eventually known as strong branching. And I took the idea and 
since I had access to the CPLEX source code, I went and implemented a bunch of stuff to implement strong branching in a smart way, efficiently, and and next by the next opportunity, I, I showed him my results, and so that's when they hired me as a as their hired LP gun <laughs> in the in the uh, in the team, and and what a fruitful uh, and and fun collaboration. I mean, you couldn't. So as a person leading the effort, you couldn't, in my mind, pick a better person than than Bill Cook. He's he is, of course, extremely bright and talented, which is always a good starting point. But he's very structured and careful. He's the kind of person who says, okay, this is my plan, and he will follow that plan. Um, and he's also one of the most honest, ethical people. If you make a contribution, you will get credit for it. He will make absolute, absolutely certain of that. So, you know, that... Um, turned out to be a, uh, a very fruitful for me and hopefully hopefully for the for the other guys so and there were lots of little fun stories um, along the way I'll um, maybe maybe mention two of them um, so um, so Dave Dave Applegate is not very not so many people know about this guy uh, which is unfortunate um, he has a, he has an ability that I've never seen, and, and I, I've worked with a lot of very talented people, with Gu, Rothberg, Cook, and Bill Cunningham, one of my favorite people, and so forth. But this guy, David Applegate, he has he can listen to a non-trivial mathematical idea, and Vashik had a lot of those, understand it in real time, and then if the purpose is some computation seemingly in real time, converted into a computer implementation. That's just amazing. That's just truly amazing. Um, coupled with that, I mean, he does have a, a, downs, a little downside, and that is it's a little bit difficult to motivate him sometimes. Very difficult, in fact. And so one such instance, there was something in the code that was really, Dave was the only person to do it, and Bill, Bill wanted to motivate him to do it. So how did he do it? I flew to New Jersey, which is where Bill was living, and Dave came up from New Jersey, and Bill was there. And we were all there just to motivate Dave. So we finally got him down to the computer, and he's been working on this thing that Bill wants him to finish. And Bill and I are kind of standing there twiddling our thumbs, you know, getting bored. We have nothing to do. We're there just to provide the environment that motivates Dave to, <laughs> to do his magic. And... So Bill is, you know, thinking to himself, you know, what can we do about this boredom? Let's pick some subject to talk about. And he thinks, well, Bob's into woodworking, and I am. I'm into woodworking. I've got all kinds of fancy woodworking tools and and so forth. And um, he thinks, well, maybe we'll talk about saw blades. No, so not a bad subject. I mean, I have a collection of saw blades you can't believe. So he, so Bill starts to talk to me about saw blades. As soon as Dave heard that, he turned around and started lecturing us on saw blades. He knew more about saw blades than I ever will know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the end of the programming. We talked about saw blades the rest of the night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my and you, goodness. And you have another story to share, right? Yeah. One other one that I think um, that I think might be of interest. So. When we solved our set our first world record, which I think was the 3,038 um, problem that we solved, we decided to celebrate and make a trip. Where should we make the trip? Well, Vashik wanted to go to Ireland because his favorite, one of his favorite authors, a U.S. Ex, expat, lived in Ireland. Okay, so we're going to go to Ireland. Of course, Vashik did not come along, <laughs> <laughs> so we got replaced by Bruce Shepard, which is another story. And so, what what was the form of this trip? The form of the trip was basically. We went from one pub to the next, trying as many different guineas as we could going around the country. <laughs> and, uh, and it was great because David Applegate was a teetotaler, so we had a driver. <laughs> <laughs> and, and rest of us could drink all the guineas, all the guineas we wanted and, you know, get to see a new country. And uh, at some point, it was time to sort of head back to Dublin and get on our way home. And 
Bill had this route he was going to take. I looked at a map. I said, what are we going that way? Well, this is much shorter. Well, my much shorter route took us through Northern Ireland. And, and, and Bill said, I don't, I don't want to go through Northern Ireland. I said, come on, look, it's a way. It's so much shorter. How bad could this be? Okay, all right, all right, all right. So we, we decided to go that route. So we, we are driving in that direction. We come to a border crossing. And we can see in the distance there's this border crossing. So we wrote, oh, geez, we need our passports. So we stop the car and open up the trunk and get our passports out and go get back in the car. Big mistake, big mistake. So we drive up to the to this bunker. It really was, I mean, this concrete thing with a little eye hole where somebody could look at us. And there's some, some eyes staring at us through this hole. And then a single, very young soldier comes out to talk, and you could see this guy was scared shitless. <laughs> and he comes around and talks to us a little bit and, and so forth, and they finally they wave us through. So then we dive down the road a little bit, and all of a sudden, a bunch of soldiers emerge from the side of the road and stop us. And this one guy comes around to talk to us sitting in the car, and you looked in that guy's eyes. I looked in that guy's eyes, and I thought to myself, if we make a false move, he'll shoot us. He won't think twice about it. <laughs> so he questions us, and we were finally allowed to drive on. And as it turned out, I didn't see this, but several of the others noticed in, in the trenches at the side of the road, there were five or six soldiers with guns trained on us in the car. And... Uh, Bill was just a little bit pissed off, to say, <laughs> to say the least. And so, at that at that point, uh, our our main goal was to find the shortest route out of <laughs> northern Northern Ireland. <laughs> so, anyway, I don't think he's ever forgiven me. Oh, for that. <laughs> unbelievable story! Uh, <laughs> and in 2008, you left iLog and co-founded Groby. Uh, could you comment mm -hmm. about this uh, transition? Sure. Um, happy to. So um, Ed and Goo decided to leave. And actually, they had gotten together and had in mind to found what turned out to be Garobi. Um, I left independently around the same time. Our reasons were not identical, um, but also not so completely different. So my reasons can, can be described as follows. Um, iLog was had this constraint programming DNA. They never understood mixed editor programming and why it had the power that it had and, and the future that it had. It was, as a result, never part of their strategic thinking. Every time they thought about a new direction or something to do, mixed editor programming was an afterthought. It was always based on something else. And just to give you some numbers of where this led, they at some point got the idea that, okay, there's something called business rules it is a direction the company should go. And business rules is it's not a complicated idea. Um, it's basically ex a version of expert systems, I suppose. Um, and it has a very easy to describe value proposition. It's attractive at a certain level. So they got into that business full scale and at some point, and I might have the numbers slightly wrong, but the following is pretty close to true. ILOG had revenues of say around 200 million and 160 of that was from business rules. But that's only part of the story. The remaining um, 40 million was not completely from CPLEX, but was mostly from CPLEX. And in fact, the profitability of CPLEX on its small part was according to their accounting, 12 million. I think in reality, because of some accounting tricks, it was actually bigger than that. The profit for the company was 2 million. In other words, CPLEX was the cash cow that was supporting this whole effort into this completely different technology. And we just, I just sort of had it at some point and uh, decided to leave. Uh -huh. And then um, I got in touch with Ed and Goo after that and asked them if they would be willing to include me in their I idea of a new enterprise. And they said, they thought about it and said yes, and the rest is history. Yeah, and that's how Gurabi came to be, and Goo, exactly. Edward Rothberg, Raw, and you, 
B from Bixby, so Grubby, for those uh -huh. who are not uh, familiar with the story. So yeah. And, and how does it feel to compete against Cplex? It doesn't bother me. It never bothered me in the least. So I, I get more than my share of credit for Cplex. Um, there are still lots of people who actually think I'm still involved with, with Cplex. Um, so I, as I say, I got, I get plenty of credit and, you know, it's not very often mm -hmm. in any sort of world and in particular in the academic world that you do something and 40 years later, people are still very interested in it. So I have that privilege uh -huh. of being in, in that position. And so I don't, I have no regrets and, um, no, doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And Cplex currently me. holds about 70% of the market or so, right? We estimate, it's just an estimate, but we estimate it's about it's about 70%, even though uh, IBM is totally abandoned. It's, um, um, there are no developers, there's no nothing around it. Mm -hmm. It's still a good code. It's still a good code. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and what's your take on the practical use of branch cut and price frameworks? Yeah. Okay. So let me just take the, the question more generally frameworks, because there have been attempted frameworks for that, and there have been frameworks for um, stochastic programming, for example, which was attractive. Um, the problem, uh, just my personal view, none of, none of this has ever worked in commercially. And in my view, one of the fundamental problems is these frameworks are never an exact fit. Never, nobody's ever found the framework such that you go to a company and ah, yeah, that framework fits. I can use it. With you know, with Groby, we don't have that problem. Everybody has to write an MPS file fundamentally, and bingo, we can read it and we can try to solve it. Okay, um, so there's no such issue. And, and the up, the implication of that is that you will almost assuredly have to couple an offering like that with a consulting practice that helps your customers implement. And you could do that. I don't think anybody has ever tried that in earnest, but you have to recognize that consulting is a very low margin business and people intensive. So you would have to start out with this framework and make a commitment. You'd have to get capital to make a commitment to build up a consulting team to try to turn this in, into a business. And nobody has ever has ever done that. Right. And okay. and what's your take on robust optimization? I uh, it's I, you know my simplistic view, it's 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 too uh, what's the right word? Um, over conservative, maybe? It's it's too conservative. Yeah, you look at the solutions and just nobody's gonna do that. When you look at the solution and how much you have to give up to be quote safe unquote is just too much. You know, maybe some new version of robust optimization will come along, um, uh, or some way to take the ideas from robust optimization and use them to produce something that isn't so conservative um, could be successful. But um, you know, robust optimization is not. You know, stochastic programming in general. Dancing pivoted almost immediately from linear programming back to stochastic optimization back in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, he knew it was important. He knew that was the next really important thing that needed to be done. And there have been multiple attempts at frameworks, but it's it's kind of the same story, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, maybe somebody will come along with an approach that gets around that. I mean, uh, if we saw what we considered a, a solid opportunity, especially especially stoch something stochastic, we would be all over it. Mm -hmm. And any recent ideas from academia that have boosted the performance of Gurobi? Not so much. Um, it's, um, there's there's a, an idea called soft symmetry, which is now used in linear programming. And that is in the public domain. There's a paper out there that, um, that describes it. Um, mixed integer programming, I don't know of anything recent. There's certainly a, a, there's a literature on incumbent improvement procedures. So primal primal heuristics for improving an existing, using the fact that you have an existing integer feasible solution. These sort of these rinse ideas, R-I-N-S, um, 
which stands for whatever it stands for. <laughs> um, and um, much of that is in the open literature. I think Ed has played, Ed Rothberg has played such an integral role in that. I mean, you could argue we would, even without the, the literature, we'd be pretty much at the same place right now, but there's, there is an open literature mm -hmm. in that. I mean, cutting planes, for example, it's just extremely difficult to do cutting plane research that's meaningful in terms of potentially contributing to solving real world problems. It's just, there's so many cutting plane types built into a code like Garobi and the interaction between the various types is so complex. There's so many overlaps. It bothers us, by the way, it really bothers us that you've got a technology that is so powerful and so useful in practice and can do, can do apart from making money with it, you can do so many good things in, in environmental applications and medical applications and the like. There's no significant research community working on ideas to improve mixed integer programming computation. And that's mm -hmm. unfortunate, but we don't frankly know quite know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And what do you think of this AI hype and its impact in mathematical optimization and practical use and so on? So um, if we step back just a little bit and just take analytics. So I think the emergence of this sort of analytics movement is extremely good for optimization. So what this has led to is that companies and the management of companies at the highest levels recognize that they have a ton of data and that they need analytical methods, whatever those methods might be, to make the best use of that data. And that in and of itself is a huge step forward. For the first time, you can literally have companies with like a chief analytics officer or somebody who's at the highest levels, maybe an executive vice president who has the ear of the CEO who can talk about the importance of these things. So that's that's a huge change. And that's, that is a very uh, positive change. And, and we fit into that story. You can ar argue how well we fit into that story, how big a piece we have, um, but it's positive. As for the sort of specifically the AI component, I also think that's very positive. Um, if you want to put it in these terms, the market share that say machine learning has as compared to what we have, I mean, totally dwarfs um, optimization, totally. Um, but that, I, I'd like to change that. I don't think that's so terrible. Um, I think it's a sign of how big the machine learning uh, the market is, and I think there are plenty of opportunities for synergies. We're starting to do things to exploit some of those potential synergies. I think also people are beginning more and more to recognize, you know, this standard thing that that people know, but it takes time. And that is that you you don't with predictive analytics, machine learning, data science, call it what you want. You get estimates, you don't get decisions. Mm -hmm. and and we can provide decisions and there's lots of evidence that we can can do that we can also actually replace machine learning in in some places there are examples of that in the academic literature where there's some machine learning things that you could actually you can see that with simple regression models that have complicating constraints that you can do better so i think it's very good and also i think it's true that that the this whole machine learning thing is legitimizing a mathematical approach to data. And so that makes it easier for us to talk about doing mathematical optimization. So I think, you know, all of that is, um, is positive. And if I go a little bit further uh, to a little bit more pie in the sky, um, for years and years, people have been talking about, um, so the roadblock, for optimization is the modeling step, no question about it. And people have thought, you know, oh, we've got this new uh, algebraic modeling language, or we've got this this new gadget that will make it accessible, uh, optimization modeling accessible to the business user or whatever. Nobody's come close. Nobody's come close. The modeling part is still there, but there are now some signs that there may be a little bit of progress. People um, are looking at these 
at these rudimentary models that ChatGBT can put together. And they require a lot of work, but they give you a starting point in the view of some. So maybe something will happen there that would be hugely uh, positive um, for optimization. So I'm less pessimistic about that last thing than if you had asked me four or five years ago, I would have said, no, it's not going to happen. They've been trying for years, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you consider mathematical optimization as part of AI? We do, absolutely, it is. And you just have to think about it for a second. We have applications now where the application runs in real time and the decisions, the answers that come out of the optimizing are implemented automatically without any human intervention. Intervention. If that's not AI, I don't know what AI is. Right. Uh, Bob, uh, do you have any regrets? Um, I don't have any major regrets, let me put it that way. I think that um, the big decisions that I've made in my life about the wonderful woman that I married, um, getting involved in what turned out to be CPLEX, uh, the Garobi story and other, you know, including getting Janet and Todd involved. And those decisions I think have, have turned out to be right. And I'm happy with those decisions. And uh, so I don't, I don't have any major regrets. And besides, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm a person to dwell on mistakes anyway. <laughs> um, at some point you have to move along. So there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we expect from you in the following years? Um, I'm retired. No, I'm not completely retired. I, um, I, I get to express my opinions about uh, the way Garobi is managed and the directions that it takes and so forth. And I expect to continue that at least for a few more years. Uh, it's conceivable that I might, people keep asking me to write a paper about the linear programming story, and I might do that, but that's probably the extent of it. I, my research days are, are over. <laughs> All right. Bob, thank you so much for your time. Uh, yeah. I had uh, so much fun listening to these great stories of yours. I learned quite a lot. And I'm really sure that uh, viewers and listeners are going to be really pleased uh, with this. So uh, I can't thank you enough. It's, it has been a treat. Thank you so much. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity. And I'm reminded of, I think you attributed a, a, a statement to Dimitris Petsimus about your podcasts providing an oral history of yeah. the things that have happened, uh, especially before you know old timers like myself are gone from the uh, from the picture, and I, I think you're doing us a great service. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure, and, and it's great to hear uh, yeah. that from you too. So so once again, thank you so much. So Bob, uh, I hope to meet you in person one of these days. Uh, who knows? Likewise, if, if you are interested in visiting Brazil, just let me know. So <laughs> maybe you not, can uh, meet. Not it's not unfortunately high. I've been there a couple of times. <laughs> but that was in connection with math programming programming meetings many, many years ago. And we are doing a lot of traveling, but it's all kind of uh, revolves around our yacht that we have that we're taking around the world. Wow, so, you uh, have a yacht. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, let, oh, yeah. As, a, as a fun fact, right? As a last, uh, as a last story, it's, uh, it's great. Yeah. 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 Anyway, Bob, thank you so much. Uh, and take Thanks. care, take care of your health. Um, and let's, let's see if we can meet uh, in the following years. So bye. Yeah, I, I, look, I look forward to it. Bye-bye. Thank right. you. Ciao. Bye.